community activist, co-founder of the Manzanar Committee, Manzanar Pilgrimage Pioneer. He has won election to the Los Angeles Unified School Board, the Los Angeles Community College District Board of Trustees, and the California State Assembly. He authored two bills signed into law. AB 37 conferred honorary college degrees to Nisei, who had been incarcerated in camps, and AB 1775 made California the first state to declare January 30th the Fred Korematsu Day of li Civil Liberties and the Constitution. He delivered two dynamic keynote addresses in 2017. One at the 48th Annual Manzanar Pilgrimage and at the VGM dedication on April 27th, 2017. Please welcome back Warren Furutani. Good morning and thank you very much, Phyllis. It's nice to be invited back to this very important event. When I was first contacted a year or so ago to be asked to come and participate, I thought, where are they going to put this monument? And I was thinking maybe some quiet park near the beach in Venice. And then when they told me it was going to be on the corner of Lincoln Boulevard in Venice, I said, that's just like these Venice activists. They're going to put it right in your face. And then I found out the historic significance of this corner, but I wasn't surprised that they would put an eight to 10 foot monument talking about anti-fascist politics and the importance of democracy right here where everybody's going to see it, whether they like it or not. But with this monument at that first event, I sort of made an offhand prediction that you better be careful because it's going to get defaced. And the reference point I had was when we on the Manzanar Committee put the first bronze historic plaque by the California State Historical Society at Manzanar, including the term concentration camp and economic greed, which was a huge political battle to get that put in bronze. We had it placed by Mr. Cotto, who did the original stone masonry for that guardhouse at the very front of Manzanar. And what we did was when we put the plaque there, the following year we came back and it was pitted with shotgun marks. Someone took an ax to it and people said, well, we should replace it. And our conclusion was that we shouldn't, that that tells the story. That tells a story about how people are feeling about it, what we're going through, what more work we have to do. And I think the fact that even though it might have been marked with graffiti one time, the fact that your obelisk has stood on this corner with people passing by, getting off the bus, driving, this is the most busiest corner in this side of town, and nothing has happened to it, is a testament to the work that VJAM the Japanese American community, and all democracy-loving people have done to educate the community about what this episode and chapter of American history was all about. When I was on the Board of Education, I got the first high school diplomas for Nisei. And the reason I did was because my mother-in-law, Aiko Herzi Yoshinaga, some of you know, very important person in the redress movement, she came to me with her colleagues and alumni from LA High School and said, can you get us a high school diploma? And I thought, what the hell? Let's see if we can do this. And we did. And then after that, when I was in the legislature, we were able to pass a bill. And the point I want to make about the bill that conferred honorary degrees, college degrees, community college, Cal State, and UC, to Nisei they were pulled out of their college experience because they were put in camps is that on the floor of 80 members, there was not one no vote. One Republican left the floor so they didn't have to vote. But 79 of them voted yes. And we were almost half Republican in those days. And I think it's a testament to the fact that people cannot deny that the wording on the front of this obelisk is in relationship not to the Japanese American community only, but to all of our community. It's a statement of democracy that makes what we're about in this country important. So ultimately, this could be just every year, whether it's the Manzanar pilgrimage or the rededication of the VJAM monument, a trip down memory lane. It could be something to use as a history lesson 
talking about the things and the way they were. Important lessons granted. But what makes it dynamic, what makes it persevere, is the fact that it has contemporary application. If you notice earlier this year, there was a demonstration at Crystal City, Texas, at the Department of Justice camp, the Japanese leaders, Japanese American community leaders, were put in without any due process. They were arrested within the first 24 hours of the bombing of Pearl Harbor without any explanation, any due process, as I said. They were put in these camps. Well, the demonstration that took place less than a month ago was also at a family detention center that's being used by the government, the Trump administration, to separate parents and children that are trying to come here for freedom. Another thing that's important relative to contemporary application is in the presidential elections, one issue is starting to emerge, and the issue is called reparations. But they're talking about reparations for slavery. When you talk about reparations or the government apologizing for acts that they were responsible with, they reference only two examples of it. One is with Sioux Indian tribes whose lands were taken away and they received reparations for them generations later. But the other one is the redress movement and reparations movement of Japanese Americans. So this is a contemporary issue that I'm sure many communities and leaders, if they have any common sense and any sense of wanting to get something done, they're going to come to the Japanese American community to ask how we did reparations and redress. But when you look at it, there's one other example that I think is more applicable. And I would say this in the presence of someone that knows it far better than I, and I'm talking about Ann Burroughs. But in South Africa, in the post-apartheid period, they had a thing called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I think that in terms of looking at whether the issue of slavery, whether it's the issue of the oppression of Native Americans, whatever the issue might be, we have to look at it differently. We have to look at it as a reconciliation. We have to look at it as an opportunity and a vehicle for healing, of understanding. And so in that process, just like we were able to educate the broader community about this important chapter in American history as it relates to Japanese Americans, I think the lessons learned relative to slavery, the lessons learned relative to the Me Too movement and the treatment of women, the lessons learned are all lessons about democracy. And that's gonna be a benefit. So I appeal to you. We have a presidential election coming up around the corner. Our primary is gonna be in March. So it's less than a year away in 2020. Don't succumb to negativism. Don't succumb to anger. You can be angry. But the point I'm making is that if you look at the issues that are being put on the table, whether we're talking about socialism or capitalism, whether we're talking about universal health care, whether we're talking about learning from the impact of slavery on people of color in this country, we have to look at it from an approach that's healing, an approach that's going to bring people together, an approach that's going to lead to the kind of community we have and want for the future. So I thank President Trump. I thank him for all the stupid things that he's saying and tweeting out. I thank him for the people that are being racist and xenophobic, Islamophobia, all of it. Because this is a wake-up call. Everybody was thinking everything's hunky-dory under Obama. Everything's fine. We're in the post-racism period. They've reminded us that there's much more work to do. The work that our good sisters and brothers here in Venice that have been doing for decades. Crazy ass progressive political work in Venice was an example because I'm cut from the same cloth in the 60s. So from that point of view, use this opportunity. Let's discuss these important issues. Let's talk about the future of our country. Let's talk about how we heal, how we bring people together to make the kind of community that won't do this kind of crap ever again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Warren. Our next speaker co-authored the book, Achieving the Impossible Dream, How Japanese Americans Obtained Redress. He delivered the keynote address at Manzanar Pilgrimage in 2012 titled, Why Remember? Then in February 2019, he had to revisit Why Remember in his op-ed essay on the forced removal and incarceration of persons of Japanese ancestry 
published in the Los Angeles Times titled An Immoral Racist Act, the motive for the Japanese internment isn't in question. Since 2016, he has served as the president and CEO of the Go For Broke National Education Center in Little Tokyo. Please welcome Dr. Mitchell T. Maki. Thank you, Phyllis, and thank you all for inviting me here today. And you know, unlike Bruce Embry, who thanked you, Phyllis, for putting him in front of Warren Furatani, I have to bemoan the fact that you put me after Warren Furatani. But when you think about it, what better individual for me to follow but a true leader, a true role model, and someone who I've respected for a very, very long time. Warren, thank you for all you've done for our community. So when I came here today and I looked at your faces, I thought of my grandmother, and I'd like to start with a comment about my grandmother. You see, if there's any word that would describe the life of my grandmother, that word would have to be hard. She came to this nation as a young child, worked on the plantations in Hawaii, got married at a young age, and by the time she was 30, had six children. She never lived much above the poverty line. So whatever dream she had for a better tomorrow rested squarely on the shoulders of her children and of her grandchildren. Now, my grandmother didn't speak much English, and I don't speak much Japanese. In fact, my favorite memory of her is of her chasing me around, yelling, Bakatare, Bakatare. <laughs> for those of you who don't know that word, it means you stupid idiot, you stupid idiot. I used to hear that so often as a child, I thought it was a term of endearment. I thought you were saying, my dear grandson, my dear grandson. But just because we, I couldn't speak Japanese and she couldn't speak English, didn't mean that we couldn't communicate because we had my mother who would translate and the message was always the same. Be good, take care of family, remember who you are. Remember who you are. And that's why we have gathered here today at this very historic point to remember what happened here and to remember who we are. And to remember that there were no charges, there were no trials, there were no convictions. And yet people lost their homes, they lost their jobs, they lost their businesses. But most of all, what was lost was a sense of place at the American table of citizenship. And yet out of that context, Young Japanese Americans chose to serve in the U.S. military, chose to put themselves in harm's way to fight for liberty and justice while their own families were denied those same constitutional rights. When asked, why are you doing this? A young sergeant by the name of Kazuo Masuda answered in a way that I think most of the veterans would have agreed, which was, because this is the only way that I know that my family can have a chance in America. Right or wrong, agree with him or not, Sergeant Masuda and the Nisei soldiers of World War II understood that in 1943, 1944, and 1945, loyalty needed to be demonstrated in blood. Fast forward now 45 years later, a bill that would provide a presidential apology and monetary reparations has passed the House of Representatives. 243 U.S. representatives, 180 of them Democrats, 63 of them Republicans, has voted for this bipartisan bill. It passes the U.S. Senate, and now we need only one more signature, one more supporter, and that, of course, was the President of the United States. And for those of you who remember 1988, that President was none other than Ronald Reagan, a very conservative President whose own administration have been fighting against redress both in the courts as well as in the Congress. For those of you who remember Ronald Reagan, whether you agreed with his policies or not, most people would say that Ronald Reagan was a great communicator. He had the ability to tell stories that would touch people's hearts and move them in a certain direction. Well, the opposite was true of Ronald Reagan. If you could touch his heart with a story, you could have a great advocate on your hands. What story could we tell President Reagan that would help him understand the significance of this bill? Well, the story of Kazuo Masuda, the sergeant who said, I'm fighting because it's the only way that I know that my family can have a chance in America. 
Two weeks after saying that, Sergeant Masuda was killed in battle, fighting for his nation, the United States of America. After the war, his family moves back to Santa Ana, California, and are met with nothing but hate speech, racism, and threats of bodily harm. The Army, realizing that this is a PR fiasco, sends out a contingent of Army officers to have a medal ceremony for the Masuda family. And at that ceremony, there was a young white American captain named Ronald Reagan. And Captain Reagan said these words to the audience and to the family of Kazuo Masuda. The blood that is soaked into the sands is all of one color. America stands unique in the world, the only country not founded on race, but on an ideal. Mr. and Mrs. Masuda, as one member of the American family to another, for what your son Kazuo did, thanks. That story was relayed to President Reagan in the late 80s, and his response was, I remember that family, and I remember what those soldiers did for America. President Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act on August 10th, 1988. Let's hear it for that day, yes. <laughs> it was a great day, not just for Japanese Americans, but for all Americans who value the Constitution and who believe in America's promise, the promise that in our land, no one is to be judged by the color of their skin, the God whom they choose to worship, or the land from which they come. It was a great day for America's promise. But lest any of us believe that justice has been securely denied and, perma and permanently secured, let me remind you of the words of the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, who said, the Korematsu decision was wrong, but you are kidding yourself if you think it will never happen again. In times of war, the laws fall silent. In times of war, the laws fall silent. Very chilling words. So as we gather here today to remember the history of this spot, to remember the sacrifices of those who went before us, and to remember the challenges that lie ahead, let us all recommit ourselves to the notion that never again in this land shall we let our laws fall silent. Thank you very much. Yeah.